Welcome to Trail and Ultra Running Training. My name is Will Franz. I'm a running coach and a strength coach. And the whole goal of this podcast is to help you train a little better so that we can have more fun out on the trails doing the things that we like to do. Today, we're going to talk about the secret to better training. And honestly, the title is kind of a dig because there is no secret. Um, we'll get to that in a second. If you like this information, I would really appreciate if you hit subscribe or like or follow or whatever tells the robots that you want to keep hearing from me. That's apparently what matters. Anyway, um, there is no secret is kind of the, the thing, kind of the dig when it comes to the title. Like, and I think some of this, I'm having a very jaded day in regards to some of my profession because like every day I see some new thing pushing some new strategy like it's the secret sauce that's going to solve all your problems and immediately allow you to transform into professional athlete and win all the races and never get injured again and maybe make the Olympics at age 55 and it's just not true and it in spite of the fact that everybody under the sun wants to sell you their special method or whatever whatever we want to call it for one, it's probably not that special, and even if it is, it probably doesn't work any better than just good training. And the reason I say this is because we've seen the training of a lot of Olympians, and it's not that special. In fact, sometimes it's almost surprising in its simplicity. And this is one of the reasons I get very annoyed at coaches who talk about their proprietary methods or who won't, who like when an athlete finishes working with them, they won't allow them to keep their past training logs if they, whatever, like take away their programs or move all the stuff off training peaks or whatever. I actually go very far out of my way to make sure that the people I coach have access to all of their past strength training, for example. Um, I use an app. For training, it makes things very convenient. I started doing this a couple months ago. It's really nice. And then I have to, but the app doesn't really allow past storage very well. Or um, it won't if you stop using it. So I go and spend a bunch of time making a Google Doc that has your past strength training because once you use it, it's yours, right? Like we should all have past access to that. Anyway, nothing is really proprietary. We are coaches who are not working with Olympians, and even if we were, it's probably not that special, I guess. Um, even something like the new double threshold thing. For one, it's not all that new. It's based off some stuff back from, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And even if it were, it's also not rocket science, right? Like, training volume is maxed out to get a particular um, adaptation, so... Our, our training and recovery ratio is not particularly favorable for what we're looking for. So if we can add a little more intensity and we can add a little more recovery, then we're going to do better. And that's just the whole double threshold thing. They added a little more recovery so they could get a little more intensity in the week uh, for humans that are already training just an insane amount of mileage. And for most of us, it's probably not needed. It's also probably good, a good idea that probably a good clue that this kind of thing would work though. And this is the thing I've been playing with for myself. I don't have long chunks of time in which I can do a ton of training. So I've been doing a bunch of mini sessions and it's been working really well. It turns out if you run three miles almost every day, in addition to other training, then your volume goes up and you get better at running. Who would have thought, right? It's not, it's not rocket science. It's trying to get faster. And just because, like, we like to, I don't know, just because we work hard at something doesn't mean it's, like, that intricate. Now, it's also not the easiest thing on the planet. It's not 2 plus 2. We do have to listen to ourselves and make, suggest make adjustments and think for half a second when we are maybe overtraining or maybe modifying or making these tweaks, right? One of the reasons things can look so new is because we get very set on what is the right way to do something. And 
if we just took some time to understand a human physiology, then fewer things would be surprising. But we don't do that. We program workouts because someone else programmed them. And a lot of the time, someone else programmed them for someone else, for some person who doesn't have a lot of crossover to you or what you need, right? Like we need to make sure that we are actually coaching the person and not the event or in coaching the person and not another person that was kind of like them, right? This is just the, the pairing that becomes difficult when we're trying to mass market some kind of coaching. Now, sorry to be such a wet blanket, but it's just, it's tiring, right? Like, I love my job. I love coaching. I just, like, one of my uh, in-person clients just left um, for the other side of the country because he got a new job, and it's great. And as he left, he said that I changed his life, and it almost made me cry, very honestly, because sometimes someone just says something very nice to you in the middle of a tiring week, and it matters, and that's great. But it doesn't mean that the current coaching landscape isn't exhausting. It is full of lies and overcharging and whatever. To be fair, I often think that we misinterpret what we're really getting when we get coaching. Like, you're you're paying for someone to fix complex problems quickly. If your coach can't fix complex problems quickly, then they're probably not a great coach. And if you don't need that, then you should buy a program for $30 and go follow it and run, because it will probably work if you work hard enough. That is a pretty good strategy. There are 150 programs out there that you could get really easily. Every training book has one. Every marathon book has one. The ultra marathon books all have some version of them. You probably have some idea of what's worked for you in the past or what wasn't, hasn't worked for you in the past. And we can just use that and make whatever tweaks you need to have it fit your schedule. That will be good. And the coaching part comes from the phone calls and the adjustments and figuring out when the injuries happen and trying to fix them faster so that you're not out for three weeks, you're only out for three days. That is the coaching part. The programming is so omnipresent. Like I'm planning to put out a few myself here soon, and it's just not, it's not the same thing. If all you need is a program, then you should probably just buy a program. And you're not going to get magically better just because you have a coach. You're going to get better because you have a good coach who can solve your problems, not just any problems. And then also who's like able to make those adjustments when you need them. That's probably a rant for a different day. Suffice to say, people pay a lot of money for mediocre coaching. And that's true in running. It's really true in fat loss. It's super true in business. I just recently learned that ad revenue for business on YouTube is four times what it is for fitness stuff, which makes sense why a lot of fitness coaches ultimately go the business route. When it comes to running better, to actually trying to improve at something we say that we enjoy, that we love to do, we struggle to spend a dime on it, or we spend lots of dimes on like shoes and goos and whatever, but not for a professional that will help us improve. And it just feels kind of backwards to me. But that's the landscape, is that I'm frustrated, and as frustrated as I am with it, that is where it is. And so I'm just going to stick over in my little corner and try to provide good shit for a reasonable price. And I'm actually working on creating a few really cheap things for people who can't afford or have no desire to invest in coaching. I realize it's a big step for a lot of people, um, be a step for me, for being honest. So, you know... It's what we're like trying to figure out how to serve more humans. So um, B and I keep an eye out for that as I get my act together and hopefully make some things. Um, we'll see considering the race season that is coming. But kind of brings me to the whole topic for the day, which I'm just tearing from an earlier an email I wrote earlier this week which I said, I feel like we overcomplicate training. And I think we spend so much time talking about VO2 max and lactate and intervals, exactly how long your longest run should be, and double thresholds and whatever. And it's not that none of it matters. It really does. But I think for a lot of people, we can probably get really good results for with a very simple approach of 
run a little more every month, and that's it. And I'm about to overcomplicate it, largely because I know someone's going to take that out of context and say something like, when does it stop? Or if I'm running more every month, then eventually I'll be, I'll be doing this running or I'm going to run 120 miles a week or whatever. Um, I, it's not silly. It's fair. Like that's a super fair thing. Um, but if we just ran a little more every month and then take the occasional off week when we need it or when life hands it to us, we'd probably get pretty damn good at running. If we just got our shoes on, got out the door and ran. And that's really the key, I think, to getting a lot better at this sport. And I think that is how a lot of very good athletes got very good at this sport. We tend to look at people when they're peaking or on the top or winning championships and seeing what their training is and seeing how to make adjustments. And if you are another coach of a similar caliber, that's a very good thing to do. Um, if you are trying to, if you were coaching someone from a 208 marathon to a 204 marathon, we should probably know exactly what needs to happen. If we are coaching someone to try to get a sub three hour marathon, not that that's not an impressive thing, I couldn't do it, but a lot of the time, that level of improvement is just going to be running more and actually doing things like speed work and focusing on recovery and fueling well. I was talking to someone the other day, and he's saying that he wants to like get a th sub three marathon, and he's just gotten like 305, 301, 303, and then he talked about his fueling strategy, and he's only consuming like 30 grams of carbs an hour. It's like, well, dude, you're like a third of what professionals do. So that's probably it. If we just like double two and a half times that, I almost promise you'd run sub three. And it's often this very simple stuff. We don't need to overlook it. It's like if, if we, instead of looking at what high performers are doing now as they're at the peak of their game, if we looked more where they were when they were at a similar level to us, I think we'd got to get a lot more. Like, I don't necessarily need to know exactly what Inger Britson's double threshold days look like when he literally runs twice as fast as I do and puts down four or five times the weekly mileage. Instead, if we're looking to professionals for inspiration... Maybe we should think about what they did when they were starting, when they were building this base, when they were just like finding a love for the sport and getting after it. And the answer tends to be they ran a lot, they ran hard, and they had a lot of fun. And if we look at someone like Killian's autobiography, like before all the fame and the specific heart rate training and working with uphill athlete and the records and the everything... He spent all of his free time trying to see if he could climb mountains really fast. And that's probably a pretty good factor in why he can climb mountains really fast. And yet I think so much of us get focused on exactly what our training percentages should be and when we need to do speed work and how long our longest long run should be. And it just doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, we just need to run consistently and run a little more. And I'll define what I mean by more in a second, because no, you don't need to run 200 miles a week. But you need to hit the consistent thing. And this is why I talk about fun so much, because if you're having fun, you will be able to be consistent with it. Because a lot of the time when I talk to people, they're like, oh, I run 40 miles a week, or oh, I run 25 miles a week. And we look at it and it's like, yes, you ran that number, like, let's say 40. You ran 40 miles last week, but the week before that you ran 10, the week before that you ran 25. Or, yeah, you run 25 miles a week, but you've done that for like two weeks. And prior to that, you had six weeks more or less off, um, which leads to not the performance you're trying to get. And when we think about increasing every week, we can 
we can increase in a wide range of factors, right? Um, but when we're doing this like constant up and down, we're not increasing at all. We're just staying at this very stable monthly average. And this is why in the earlier I didn't say run a little more every week. I said run a little more every month because you're going to see some ups, you're going to see some downs, there will be faster periods, whatever. But if we just steadily increase our running, we will do better. And to be clear, when I say increase or run more, it can mean more miles, it can mean more time, it can mean more intensity. Um, and it should probably be somewhat supportive to what we're ultimately trying to do. But we should understand that even if we're looking at hiking, if you get faster on flat ground, you will do better at hiking as long as you spend enough time to like get the movement pattern down. Fitness is going to be your biggest proxy if we just get fast and get powerful and then just learn a couple skills, we will do better at the uphill. Right? But most of us spend a lot of time thinking about there's a point where you don't need to run more 12 minute miles. We need to run fewer 12 minute miles and more eight minute miles. <clears throat> and this is where more can get complicated because four miles at a nine minute pace is more stimulus than four miles at a 10 minute pace, right? If we were running faster at these for the same distance, then it is more in terms of stimulus. So if we keep everything the same, from mileage to training ratios, whatever, and just run a little faster as we get more fit, we'd be providing a slightly different stimulus. And this is actually one way that you can very appropriately scale your training. Don't focus too much on heart rate or mileage or get obsessed in running the same loop. Go run for an hour. And if you run for an hour, like let's say every Tuesday, you decide to run for 60 minutes and you run it at a challenging but comfortable pace. Like you can have a conversation, but you probably don't want to. After doing that every Tuesday for a year, I bet you'd be covering more mileage in that hour. Or we probably haven't been pushing hard enough when we've been doing a lot of like trotting, right? Which is totally okay. That is a race strategy, but if we're trying to improve, then training is going to be a little hard. Now, the thing that can really throw a wrench in the gears is recovery and injury, and I think this is where we get thrown, because a lot of the time we push too hard or too quickly, and we get hurt, and we get burnt out, and we end up having to go, it's not like that 40 to 10 to 25 mile swings intentional, it happens oftentimes because we get hurt or because like we have to take care of stuff in our life, or because we just don't feel like running because we did way too much one minute. It's like the old standard yo-yo dieting where you like go on such a massive calorie restriction that you end up binging in response and every weekend, and then we wonder why we haven't like seen any progress in that realm. Same kind of thing with running. We go so hard for like two weeks. We run 40 or 50 miles a week, and then we just get really burnt out, and then we only run 10 for two weeks because we're tired. And if we just made slow progress, we would see a lot more movement on the skill scale. If we added a mile every week to your running volume, one mile, you would have added 52 weekly miles by the end of the year. It's a lot. It's more than most people run. And yet, if we're talking week to week, it doesn't feel like enough in the moment. And this is because we just don't have this like long outlook. We don't have this trajectory. We, if we don't, we want to make progress faster. So we push too hard and then we get hurt or we push too hard and then we get burnt out and then we don't make progress at all. Training doesn't need to be super complicated if you're willing to take a slightly longer trajectory. It can be really complicated, but it's rarely necessary. Most of the time, we just need to run more and by more, it can mean more mileage or it can mean a little more intensity. And I mean a little. We don't need to crank the shit out of it. We just need to slowly make an effort to improve a little more every month. And 
Again, I say every month because every week is unreasonable. You should take a deload week. We should take a back off week. But every month, if we made a little bit of progress, we would ultimately get better. Run faster, avoid injury, keep having fun, do all these things, right? A lot of my job as a coach is to try to help people figure out how to run more miles faster without getting hurt or burn out. And it is different for everybody. For some people, it is really long runs in the mountains every Saturday. For others, it's a lot of daily work. For others, it might be doubles. For some, it might be like extra miles on the end of a speed workout. There are so many ways to get good at this sport and add mileage. It is just a like balance of figuring out how to create that constant increase in stimulus without like as much risk of injury, right? I was going to say per- while preventing injury, but that's not real. Like we can't ever fully prevent injury, but we can reduce the potential, right? There's no secrets. There's just trying to keep all your ducks in a row while we achieve what we're trying to achieve, right? So if you push so hard that you have to take two weeks off, it doesn't matter how big the stimulus was, your volume is still going to be too low to make progress. Anyway, that was just largely a lot of words to say that if you just run more, you'll probably get better. And if you want more insight on how you can run more without getting hurt, then shoot me a message on any of the platforms, preferably Instagram or reply to an email or yeah, Facebook I have, but I'm not on it as much. So if you really want to find me, shoot me a DM on Instagram or shoot me an email. My email is somewhere. If you're not on my email list, get on it and then I'll email you probably more than you want. And then you can just hit reply and we could have a chat. Anyway, I'd be happy to help. I hope you have a great next run and have a great rest of your day. Thank you again for listening to the Trail and Ultra Running Training Podcast. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Just a reminder, nothing you hear on this podcast is medical advice, and you should always speak with a medical professional before making changes to your training or your nutrition. If you enjoyed the podcast or found it helpful, please leave a rating or review. It tells the algorithm robots that people like it, and that means more people will hear it. Or even better, just share it with someone who you think would benefit. If you prefer a video version, head to the Trail and Ultra Running Training Group on Facebook, or check out the Mountain Goat Endurance Coaching YouTube channel. Thank you again, and I hope you have a great next run.